Oh, I'll get back into the rhythm of things eventually, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a, quite an adventure getting back, uh, flying through Denver. All of the weather uh, interrupted my travel on multiple days, uh, the tornado warnings there and everything else, and so I didn't get back in and uh, get in bed last night till after midnight, and uh, so uh, I knew I was going to be just a little bit off, and that was just the one thing that I'm going to do wrong today, just got it out of the way early, that way I don't have to worry about it. Uh, but uh, it was a good trip, and it's always good to see my folks. I haven't actually seen them in, uh, it's been two years uh, because of just the timing of when I usually go and COVID, uh, precluding travel safely. Uh, so it was uh, actually very good to catch up with them. I always, uh, I always experience or learn something new when I, when I go back to uh, Arkansas, and this time was no different. Uh, I had uh, my, my sister and my mom uh, had a new recipe they wanted to share with share with me and of course it wasn't the recipe itself they shared as much it was what the recipe produces uh, but uh, anyway it I'll describe it for you it was a it was a it was a big plate and uh, you take deep fried uh, french fries you know and you cover the plate and then you spread over that uh, pork barbecue you know barbecue pork and then you pour cheese sauce all over the top of that and then you drizzle ranch dressing on top of that and um, they call that hog fries. Uh, and uh, so I guess out of deference to the, the Arkansas Razorbacks, and um, uh, it, it was quite tasty, I'll have to say. Uh, but I will, uh, I will have to admit that probably for me, it will be a treat that I enjoy when I go down there to visit because if I ate it all the time, well, uh, I would probably be a hog. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, it was good though. I, I did enjoy it and appreciated the efforts uh, that uh, were that were made to uh, enlarge my girth. So uh, anyway, it's it's good to be back uh, uh, back in the Northwest, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing a portion of God's word word with you out of uh, First Corinthians, and I appreciate it so much. Uh, I, I've said it before, and uh, I continue to to iterate it that it's uh, it's very reassuring to me to know that uh, there are uh, capable uh, capable people here Brad and uh, Kevin are, are very uh, good to work with uh, on staff here for our pastors and uh, it's a uh, it's just a great comfort to me uh, my mom and dad live out in the boonies and so uh, I didn't get a chance to watch the sermon last week until I went to the airport which I was there for quite a while so uh, I got a chance to listen to the sermon at the airport because their internet was better than my folks. Uh, and I, uh, he did a great job uh, really uh, expounding on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is where we're going to go today. And uh, we talked about this as he was uh, preparing for it, uh, that there were several things that I wanted to be able to, uh, to go through as we look at 1 Corinthians. And uh, one of the things that we've done, over, especially over the last three chapters, has been to spend some time looking at the, uh, in the primary subject and the immediate context of the passage, uh, which in this case, as, as Kevin dealt with it uh, very well, was church discipline. And, uh, but what we find as we go through this, that really as the Apostle Paul uh, spoke to the church at Corinth, he actually implied much, much more in the text and uh, addressed some key areas of church practice. And uh, so uh, we kind of split this up a little bit uh, Kevin was going to deal with the immediate, uh, the immediate context and primary subject, and then I was going to spend a little bit of time when I came back uh, looking at the implication of some of the teaching that winds up coming out of uh, that direct context, some of the things that are implied. And because they're implied doesn't mean that, uh, that they don't carry weight. Uh, it means that we have to be careful as we reason our way through those, but I think it still is an imperative that we do that. It was interesting, the passage of scripture that uh, Cameron uh, read in Psalm chapter 40, where he, he wrote, uh, or the psalmist wrote there that, uh, I share all of God's truth with you. I don't hold anything back. And Kevin mentioned this last week that when you begin to look at the subject of church discipline, it's not a topic that you see very much uh, if you just do a little bit of a search online. Uh, you don't see a lot of sermons, especially uh, by those that uh, maybe are, are a little bit more mainstream, uh, and the reason is is because uh, it, well, number one is is it's not uh, it's not a, a real favored topic to preach on. Uh, 
uh, because when you preach on it, it, it implies at least uh, as we study scripture that we're not just to be a hearer of the word, but a doer. So if you preach on it, it means that you're going to be put in a position as a pastor and as a church to practice it. And uh, I, I really don't know um, anyone who is uh, mentally healthy who likes the confrontation and uh, the, the tension that occurs when accountability is enacted in the church. And so as we look at the, the subject of church discipline, I, I think that uh, it is an imperative that uh, we understand that it's not something that's practiced in a vacuum, that there's some things that undergird it, that make it important, uh, that make it an imperative. And the passage we're gonna look at today really brings those, uh, those particular aspects uh, of Paul's teaching out. One of the concepts that we're going to look at uh, is, uh, and you'll note the, uh, uh, the little diagram up there, and I'm going to be real picture heavy today, so if you like pictures, you're in luck today. And the reason is, is because we're talking about a topic that is not talked about very much in evangelical Christianity. In fact, the three things that I have up there, Kevin uh, covered the first one, which is the uh, immediate context of, of discipline on a member that was living in open and rebellious sin. And uh, so the other one that is right below that, and uh, you'll note that even though they have an order to them, uh, that I've got that one uh, kind, of, uh, kind of pulled out just a little bit, and that is that the membership of a church really uh, is not just to be disciplined, it is also to be defined. And uh, in evangelical Christianity, it's becoming... Uh, probably more and more a common practice that uh, in essence membership and uh, the privileges of membership are conferred upon people just by attending and uh, while that may seem like a very open-hearted uh, and uh, a very uh, a very kind way to administer this aspect of, of church practice it really winds up being destructive and, it, and inadvertently it leads a church away from the, the practice in the principle of Scripture. And so what we find in uh, what Paul has done is he said that not only is the membership supposed to be disciplined, but it's to be defined. Uh, in essence, what does that mean? It means we need to know who is on the team. We need to know who has signed up. We need to know who has decided that I want to be a part of this congregation I want to place myself underneath the teaching authority and ministry of this church. I desire the accountability that comes inherently within that relationship. And I, I don't think a lot of times uh, that uh, that is uh, really laid out uh, in, a, in a clear fashion. And what does that mean practically? It means that we view being a part of a church as a relationship, a covenant relationship, where the person says, I desire to be a part of this assembly, and the assembly reciprocates and says, we desire you to be a part of us. And inherent within that relationship are certain things. One of them uh, is the principle of discipline that is enacted uh, most of the time on rare occasion, uh, even in healthy churches. Uh, and, uh, it, but it is, it is enacted when the occasion demands it. It's not something that's entered into lightly, it's not something that is typically or shouldn't be entered into hurriedly, uh, but it is something that does occur. Uh, it actually you know, creates just a little bit of angst, I think, in our hearts as we think about this. But if several weeks ago I shared a quote with you from a pastor. I didn't go and dig it up so I could share it again, but I paraphrase and say that most of us say that we want accountability in our life, but typically accountability uh, doesn't really have any functional value. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't keep us uh, from doing the things that we want to do ultimately unless we've placed ourselves in a position where we are responsible and we grant authority to someone else to speak into our life in an authoritative way. And that's an inherent part of church relationship. What it says is, is that I desire to serve Jesus Christ. I want my life to reflect who he is, and I want this church's help uh, to be able to do that. So that's implied, something that's implied in the lessons that we're going to look at today. Uh, and we also see there the words devoted, uh, which a lot of times we, uh, uh, I, in the context of what I'm speaking of today, when I say devoted, I mean sanctified, sacred, or holy, that God has called us to this. 
and we'll talk a little bit about that and about how that has implications even in other things that we practice as a church. As I said, these are not something that are talked about uh, very widely uh, in the church community today, uh, but they are something that really needs attention. And as we work our way through God's Word, especially when you go through uh, in an expository fashion over a book of the Bible, you will find yourself confronted with these passages that you, you have to deal with them. And the practical matter of it as you deal with them is, is that uh, if you are taught them or if you teach them, uh, then you're put in a position where you need to practice them. And I think that's a lot of times why you don't hear a lot of preaching about it uh, because that relationship is something that's expounded on all the time. If you preach it, you need to practice it. So we're going to be looking at this, and as I said, uh, we're, uh, <coughs> we're going to be uh, image intensive in this. Or I, I've made some pictures, and you'll have to excuse my artistic ability uh, or my lack thereof in uh, learning to, uh, well, maybe not learning because I quit learning. I just, I, I learned enough to get by, and so you'll be the victim of my diagrams today. But this is the first one that I think really bears uh, you know, giving attention to as we enter into some of what's implied in this passage in 1 Corinthians 5. So the first verse of Scripture associated with what I want to talk about today is in James. And in this basic principle, Scripture teaches about separation from the world and what that needs to look like, uh, not so much the practical aspects of it, but uh, God's expectation of it. He says in James 4, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? And therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God has called out uh, a separate people for himself. And uh, he tells us, he's called us out of the world, and he tells us that we're not to be friends with the world, which in essence means we're not to align ourselves with them. We're not to put ourselves in binding relationship uh, that can take priority over our relationship with God. This is the responsibility of a believer, to protect the liberty that's been given by God to the believer to live our life completely and wholly for him in freedom. We have to protect that by not aligning ourselves with things or in things that will preclude that. And uh, that's just a basic principle of scripture. And I lay that out there because I think it's going, to, it's going to assist us as we go through this to understand why it is that God approaches this the way that he does through the teaching there of the Apostle Paul. To continue in that frame of thought, if you were to go back to the Old Testament, you would find in Leviticus 27, he says, But no devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord, of anything that he has, whether man or beast, or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. And so this is really God's plan for those things that, or people that are devoted to him. You might remember the story in 1 Samuel of Samuel the prophet and of his mother devoting him to the Lord, of setting him apart uh, as uh, really a, uh, an offering, really, in this sense, and that he was to be holy. And this is, this is really God's plan. It's his approach to things, and it plays in heavily in the way that we are supposed to practice uh, as a church. So you move on just a little bit further and go back into James chapter 1 and verse 27, and the practical aspect of it is this, is that God commands us that if we want our religion to be pure, uh, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. And then the last part especially that we're focusing in on, not to the exclusion of the others, but just focusing on the fact that he wants us to remain unstained from the world. And a part of this is, is that scripture commands us God is holy. We just got through singing about that. He wants us to be holy. So that's not really a surprise to us, uh, but what I think many times is a surprise to people is that somehow we've reconciled in our mind with this cognitive dissonance that I can serve my own interest and still serve the interest of God in holiness. What does that mean? It means that I feel like I can live in unholiness and still somehow things are okay with God. And I find that is a very, very common thing uh, in Christianity today. I have people tell me all the time, well, I know what the Bible says, but I think God is okay with this. 
And, you know, in essence, what it says is, is that God has made an exception for me. He wants me to be happy. He doesn't want me to be holy. And this is, this is the, the conflict that winds up being, becoming apparent as we live our life in our efforts to keep ourselves uh, unstained from the world uh, in its ways. So, you know, as we move into our text this morning, and I'm not going to go back over really in the, in the same way that uh, Kevin did in, in describing all of the things that surrounded the discipline that Paul commanded the church at Corinth to exercise on this person who was openly uh, in uh, a, a you know in a, an adulterous relationship in a uh, in a, uh, a state of fornication, uh, but he commanded him to nonetheless. But Paul said or commanded them nonetheless. But Paul said in verse one, and you begin to see here uh, in our text that he condemned the church for their disobedience to this principle. And he says, actually, it's reported among you that there, or it's re actually reported that there is immorality among you. And so, in essence, what we have uh, in this conversation is Paul says, there is a lack of holiness, a commitment to holiness and accountability in your congregation. He said, it is something that is named among you. This is occurring within your midst. This isn't somebody who used to go to church and has just decided they don't want to serve God anymore and, and uh, moved on down the road as far as their life was concerned and, and is just living any way they want. This is someone that was numbered among them, that was actively a part of them and has just said, you know, I want to live the way that I want to live. Paul says they are among you and there is immorality that should not exist in that place. And so that's the first part of it. We see Paul uh, calling that out. And then he gives them, and Kevin covered this last week, he gives them um, the solution for that. He gives them the treatment for this. Uh, as we move on into the text, he says, You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, uh, so that the one who had done the deed would be removed from your midst. So in essence, it, it didn't grieve the heart of the church uh, to such an extent that this immorality was openly being practiced. Uh, it, it didn't cause them grief. In essence, they either turned a blind eye to it uh, or they tacitly endorsed it uh, by just pretending, you know, that uh, it was okay. And Paul condemned them for this. And you'll notice in the diagram there that uh, when unholiness, when open rebellion and sin against, you know, basic principles of Scripture exist, uh, exist and a person's living in rebellion. Kevin covered last week, Matthew 18, that process that is a church that we're to go into and go through in order to help this person who has become a captive to sin once again. And this is the imperative that Paul placed out there. And what he said is, is that this person needs not to be in your midst. He said, instead, they need to be removed from your midst. And so you can see there that uh, the command is, is to separate, that the church is to separate themselves from that. Uh, and Kevin ably covered last week, this doesn't mean that you don't love. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have hopes of restoration. It means that where God is concerned, when he lays out something, we really as a church don't have a choice but to be obedient to it if we're going to follow the calling that God has put in our life. So he exhorts them to maintain their devotion by or their devotion, their holiness, by removing an unrepentant member from their midst and to place them out into the world. And the scripture goes on a little bit further, and Paul will jump to verse 5 there, and he actually begins to, to really lay out what the significance of this is, of how heavy and weighty a matter this is. And as I mentioned to you before, it's serious business. It's not to be entered into lightly, uh, but with much trepidation. Uh, I think that it should be approached slowly so that there is space for repentance on the person who is, uh, who is in a place of, of blindness to their own sin and the deceit of that. I think that it needs to be uh, enacted in a compassionate way. I think that it's probably best enacted from the basis of relationship. I think that it's an opportunity to affirm love and to affirm a commitment to truth but it needs to be entered into nonetheless. But as we look at what Paul said, he said that there is great weight in this. And even though you may approach it with all mercy and all compassion, 
and all desire for restoration, you need to understand God's intent in this. He said that really what's occurring is that they're being delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, you know, in essence, God communicates through the Apostle Paul here that he is serious about each of us as believers being conformed to the image of Christ. He, he's serious about that. He has a vested interest in that. And, you know, it, it is not to be undertaken lightly, but it is to be undertaken because God has a distinct purpose in it. And he says that discipline occurs and it's not pleasant. But scripture te speaks to us of this in Hebrews 6 that no discipline for the moment is pleasant, but in the end what it yields is the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And I can testify to that in my own life. I can testify to that in the lives of my kids too. There was nothing like a little bit of discipline to bring back the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our house. You know, it just, yeah, I just believe what God says and it, it, it just works. But uh, anyway, Paul says uh, this is something that is an imperative and he is less concerned about our comfort than he is about our character. He is intent on pressing you into and conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. He is so intent on that uh, for you, for me. And sometimes we look at it and we just think God's not really serious about this, but he is. And he's also intent on having a covenant people that is holy in reflection of him so that they can be used for his good work. Uh, because you see, God will use a cracked pot. And if you're like me, that brings you a lot of comfort, right? He'll use a cracked pot, but he won't use a dirty pot. And so this is the imperative that Paul puts forth to the congregation in Corinth. He really kind of begins a little bit of a segue there and he brings in some of what's implied and the practical implication uh, of an internal reason for that extreme measure. Uh, and that is the purity that needs to occur in partaking of the Lord's table. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, for as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And Paul, in a very, very strong way, I believe, alluded to the idea uh, of the Lord's table, of communion, of the Lord's Supper, and of the importance of purity as we approach that. Now, that's not something that winds up being, you know, uh, it doesn't wind up being foreign to us in the most part. We do understand that God has called us uh, to judge ourselves. In fact, Paul wrote about this explicitly to the church at Corinth uh, a little bit later in the book that we're studying. And he says, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. And this doesn't mean you just fall asleep in church. It's a euphemism for death. All right. I, said, I know that's probably a relief for you. It's like if you go to sleep in church, it's, I don't think that it means you haven't judged yourself appropriately for the Lord's Supper. But, uh, but Paul, he, he lays this out. Because he says there is a danger of bringing God's judgment on the partaker who has not judged themselves or one who has been judged by the many uh, or the majority. And so you can begin to see some of the practical uh, teaching working in there uh, as Paul alludes to the feast that they keep, which there is no other feast than one that would, uh, you know, in symbology would be associated with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but instituted by Christ at Passover which we know as the Lord's Supper, uh, a new covenant uh, symbol, if you will. And he says in your practice of that, he said there are certain things that need to occur. You need to judge yourself. And then over in 1 Corinthians 5, he says, but not only are you supposed to judge yourself, but sometimes we just fail to judge ourselves. You need the safety and the insurance policy of having other people who love you enough to, to judge you. What, what does that mean? It means that they love you enough that when your life starts to skid sideways, they reach out to you and say, hey, let me help you get back on track. Let me help you with what you're struggling with. 
Let me, let me help you be restored to a place uh, of functional obedience with the Lord. You know, this is, this is the safety net that God has built in. A lot of times we view it as something restrictive, and it is restrictive. Uh, it is also protective. Uh, Kevin mentioned that there is protection within the Lord's church from the destruction of the flesh and Satan's hand upon you and uh, God's uh, judgment falling heavily upon you. And some of that, I think, is just God's decision uh, to do that for churches. But I think another part of it is just a very practical thing, that part of the protection that goes along with being a functioning part of a church is that if you start to stumble, there's someone there to pick you up, someone there to come alongside you, and someone that loves you, someone that is committed to you, and this is what a family relationship is supposed to reflect. And we call a church a family all the time. Uh, but uh, I, I think many times we shrink away uh, from some of the implication of that. The Apostle Paul, really what's an interesting thing is, is as this winds up being enacted, uh, he did so for, uh, you know, really uh, the protection of that individual. It was a matter of love. Uh, it, it, withholding from them the privilege of membership, which is to eat at the Lord's table. And, uh, you know, it's interesting if you read ahead to the next letter of the Apostle Paul uh, to the church at Corinth there, and uh, it is strongly believed and I think is, uh, is evident that uh, this person whom they dealt with, according to Paul's instructions, wound up in a place of repentance. And I think that's what Paul was writing about when he told them. He said, sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. And, uh, you know, this was, this was something that the church practiced. It's not just something that the pastors do. Uh, of course, the pastors are probably going to be an integral part of that process. Uh, but it is something that the church does. And it's something that the church in Matthew 18, we're told, is supposed to make a judgment. And if they refuse to hear the church, then they're to be uh, placed outside uh, of the church, uh, as a Gentile uh, would be, in essence, really the picture that's given. So here we have that practical outworking of it. And, you know, it bears mentioning there, if you continue on in the rest of that passage in 2 Corinthians, that the Apostle Paul says, sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. So you see the objective. You'll notice the U-turn in the arrow there an unrepentant member who God has dealt with uh, in disciplining them as a loving father would, uh, maybe even through the destruction of the flesh, maybe in a, a variety of ways that is God's business, but in essence really the, the purpose of it and the thing that we would celebrate is it just brings a person back into a place of fellowship with the church and all of the privileges that would be associated with being a part of that church. Uh, so anyway, as you, as you look at uh, what Paul continued with in verse 9, he said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. So in essence, Paul says, you know, listen, as you deal with this errant person, there's probably this tendency to say, and it really is something that arises out of a mentality that is very much old covenant, and it says that uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, the Gregorian monk who, uh, who sings out in the song and says, I am holy, you're not holy. You know, you know it'd be kind of that, uh, that attitude right there, right? Uh, and, you know, the Apostle Paul, he says, listen, the idea here is not to seclude yourself, not to withdraw and, and wait for people to come and discover your holiness. And that would be a mentality that was very much associated with the Old Covenant. Uh, it's interesting. Paul said, I, I wrote you my letter not to associate with immoral people. I'm talking about people that are within your church who say that they're a believer. 
Because that violates the call for holiness within the congregation. And it also handicaps that individual and your church from being used of God in the way that he wants to, to carry holiness to a watching world. You see, that's God's plan under the new covenant, uh, is not to withdraw and wait for those to come. Uh, holiness is not so fragile in the new covenant uh, that it can somehow be violated. Uh, you know, in the old covenant, in the, in the Old Testament of the law, uh, anything that was touched by someone unclean was unclean. But what happened under the new covenant is God sent his son to this world. And Jesus didn't have such a fragile holiness that he couldn't rub elbows with sinners. He wasn't corrupted by that. He wasn't made unholy by that. He was bringing holiness to us. And as a people, he calls us to bring holiness to the world. And it doesn't mean that we're holier than thou. But it means that we have a responsibility to keep our life free from persistent and rebellious sin. Otherwise, we can't be used in that capacity by God. And we see that, you know, this is narrowing down the focus on this uh, and the association of it to a place where how can we even practice this if there's not a recognition and a relationship existing uh, of accountability and authority? And so what this really begs is it begs a membership that is defined, a membership that says that I want to be a part uh, of this church. I want to submit myself to the teaching authority, the leadership, and the ministries of this church. I want to be a part of this, and I want it to be reflected in that uh, relationship of accountability that is real, that actually has meaning, that there, there is something there. Most accountability in Christianity today doesn't really have any meaning because there's not a provision made for enacting the teeth of it, in essence, of Matthew chapter 18. And so, you know, this is something that we have to keep in mind that's implied in this. So the teaching of that really winds up being something that we have to continually put in front of people because if you get your teaching uh, from Christianity at large, you're probably not going to be exposed to this. And you're not going to understand the emphasis and the importance uh, of finding a familial relationship that is uh, formally concluded and can be enacted in this way. Now, Paul says, you know, it's interesting, as I mentioned, this holiness. God did not call us, as Paul mentioned, to go out of the world. He said, I told you not to associate with immoral people. But I'm talking about brothers who call themselves, who call themselves brothers and are practicing that, not to associate with them. And he says, but if, but if you just practice that in general, you wouldn't be able to go out in the world. You'd stay all clus clustered together in a pocket of holiness waiting for people to come and see what it was all about. And while come and see is a, a valid challenge to a lost world, God tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And this is God's intent, that we maintain holiness uh, as a part of the sanctity of that divine calling that he has placed on the church called the Great Commission. Now, I'm not saying that God can't speak through a donkey, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that he would prefer to use us. And that's, that's his ordained, and it, it is his plan that he would have a people who are set apart and sanctified for this purpose who are enacting it. And uh, that's our responsibility to go into the world, not to, not to uh, sequester ourselves away from the world, uh, but to go into the world. Now, Paul continues and he says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And so here, here's an interesting thing, the implication of it you notice that I have the picture up in the church over there, once again, of the Lord's table. And there are several different practices with regard to uh, the Lord's table or communion. Uh, one of them that you would commonly hear is open communion, where the table is open to everyone. One is called close communion, where the table is extended as an offering to people who are saved and of, in like faith, if you will. And then the third is called closed communion 
historically, and when I say historically, I mean 100 years ago plus, Baptist typically practiced closed communion or a variation thereof. And the reason was is because as we look at this passage of Scripture, it is, it is functionally impossible to be obedient to the command of God to practice discipline and to define who is a part of us uh, so that we can do that. Uh, and it is functionally impossible uh, to practice any other way, in my estimation, as I look at Scripture and be obedient to this. That we're not to eat with those whose lifestyles reflect these things. And so as a church, why do we do that? Not because we think we're better than everyone else. Not because I am holy, you're not holy. Not that at all. Uh, but because this is God's table. It's the Lord's table. It's not up to us to define how and who we administer it to. We believe it's up to God to do that. And for us to extend or open the Lord's table to someone besides members of our church means that we're allowing people to partake of it, number one, who we may not know their spiritual condition. We may not know where they're at in their relationship with God or whether they even have one. And so, in essence, really, what we do is we put them in mortal danger, as according to what we've read in the Scripture. So that wouldn't be good. And then the other thing that we do, if somebody, if we just open and extend the opportunity to partake of the table, uh, to uh, anyone, uh, then in essence, really, we don't have the right, if they're not a part of this church, to exercise any type of accountability or discipline. We can't be obedient to the calling of not to eat with such a one, uh, because really, if they haven't submitted themselves to the responsibility, the accountability of church relationship, uh, then it just doesn't, you just can't function that way can't be obedient to the commands of God in it. Uh, so what does that mean? Is it something that's popular? Is it something that's common? Not necessarily. But uh, if in fact it aligns with scripture, uh, then I think that it still winds up being an imperative for us. This is part of the reason why you won't see us uh, partake of communion on Sunday morning. Uh, in our culture, inviting people to come and to be with you in a service and then telling them that they can't eat dinner with you would be perceived as rude. We don't want to be rude, we don't want to be offensive, but we do want to be obedient. And so to do that, what we do as a church is we meet uh, every three months uh, typically, uh, and we have a separate service that's not open to the general public. We ask our church family to come, and uh, in that one we, uh, we do what we consider a church ordinance. We practice that together. Not meant to be offensive, not meant to be exclusionary, just meant to be obedient. Um, now, you know, it's an interesting thing. It's not always perceived that way, and I fully recognize that. But I would rather have a clear conscience before God uh, than to have everybody happy uh, with me in that practice. And I think probably the same would go for our church. Uh, Paul, you know, continues to iterate in this, and uh, it, the teaching is just pervasive uh, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. This was a church that struggled with the Lord's Supper, remember. They turned it into a love feast. They weren't practicing it correctly in any facet of it. Paul actually told them, you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And in essence, really, uh, he just says that that contradiction is something that shouldn't be present uh, in your church. And you know, uh, as far as undergirding that concept of a public ministry, and yet these things being enacted as a private ministry, I think we can go back to the example of Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 uh, as he uh, instituted uh, the Lord's Supper as an, ordin an ordinance with that first church. Disciples were gathered around. He had a public ministry, but he also had a private ministry. When it came time to institute the Lord's Supper, it says when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12 uh, disciples. And that's when he instituted it. How do we know that? Uh, because as Paul was teaching the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night which he was betrayed took bread. So Paul says this is when it all started. This was the first time the Lord's Supper was taken. And the example and the model 
that was used there, uh, I think, supports the idea of only extending the table to those who are part of that congregation. In verse 12, Paul continues, and he says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? And in that passage of Scripture, one of the things that Paul clearly did there is he defined. He defined those who were outside the church and those who were inside the church. And this wasn't for the purpose of uh, high-minded, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, where, uh, where, people, where people really wind up in a position where they, they think of themselves better than others. That's completely contrary to Scripture. Now, that's not the purpose or intent of it, of separating out. The purpose or intent is separating out for a distinct, uh, for a distinct reason, that God has a desire for his people to carry the gospel to the world, and he wants them to be a people who reflect him for the effectiveness of the gospel. He wants the external things they do to reflect that and the internal with regard to the practice of the Lord's table. He wants the internal to reflect that. So these are some of the things that are implied uh, in what we've already read. And Paul finishes off that chapter in verse 13. He says, but those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And, you know, the Apostle Paul was, you know, sort of that type A personality. He was pretty, pretty direct. He just, uh, he had something to say and he, he said it. And the reason he did was because it, it was life and death was a matter of something that impacted people and their spiritual condition and their ability to be able to be effective for the work of God. And, uh, you know, these are, these are things that Paul evidently felt were important uh, in communicating to this church. And so I think they wind up being important for us as a church, too, in enacting. You know, I guess it brings about uh, this last part that I'll leave you with here. Um, and that is, uh, are you in a place where you can be obedient to this calling that God has placed on the life of a believer? See, the, the normative for a believer is that after I give my life to Jesus Christ, I would align myself with him through baptism. I would seek out biblical baptism. And then that I would, I would uh, also make myself a part of, of his covenant people who are carrying out the great commission and and living out the principles that God has given. You know, is is my life a reflection of being disciplined, of being a part of what is defined and being devoted in the idea of being set apart? See, this is God's calling. If you look in the New Testament, much of what is practiced in Christianity today, and I hear it so many times, people who who have made a profession of faith by their admission is that well um, I don't uh, you know I, I believe in God I, I accepted Christ as my Savior but uh, I, I don't go to church uh, because I had a bad experience or uh, you know I, I haven't found a church that I really like or agree with and it leaves people very vulnerable it leaves people in a place where they can't be used of God and as I mentioned it doesn't preclude someone. If God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through anyone, right? I don't mean that to be insulting. But I'm just saying, if God has prescribed a plan, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of what God is doing and the way that God is doing it. So we're going to have, uh, I don't know, uh, Cameron's going to come and uh, close us out here. I'm a picture person. I appreciate the pictures you put up there today, man. Those were helpful. And I really like the last one. I, I like that last one because it, uh, it shows some of the needs of a church, uh, of that called out group of believers that sometimes we, sometimes we need discipline. We need to be disciplined people. Uh, that, uh, that our role here is defined, that we have a defined role. Membership is important. And uh, finally, that we're devoted, that we're all devoted to uh, the Great Commission that we're commission-minded. I, I like. I really like that picture.
And it draws you to that final question that Bobby has up there for your consideration. The thing that we want you to uh, rally around at the lunch table or while you're driving home, the thing that uh, we were hoping that you would talk about is have you submitted yourself to God's plan as demonstrated in his word? That's a great question. Have you, have you submitted yourself? Uh, I think that's a great question for us all to talk about later today. And we are so happy that you came to worship with us today here at Sunbury. Thank you so much. Uh, if you could, on the back of the chairs, there's a little QR code. If you could fill out a connection card so that we could connect with you, so we could talk more about uh, what Bobby talked about or any questions you have, we would really appreciate that. Also, if you want a physical connection card, if you don't have a, a smartphone or you want a physical connection card, back on the back table there are physical connection cards there for you. And there's pens and you can drop it into one of the offering boxes that are on the back of the wall. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to pray for you before I let you out into the wild. Uh, dear Lord and most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Father. Thank you that you are more worried about our character than you are about our comfort, Father. Uh, thank you for this challenging lesson. And thank you for church membership. Thank you for all that you've called us to. Thank you for that great commission and help us to be commission-minded, Father. We love you so much and I pray the safety of all these people on their way home and uh, we pray that you be there in their conversation today. We love you. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen.